You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Corey DeAngelis of the Cato Institute. Corey, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Hey, thanks, Garrett. I'm glad to be on the show with you. So our topic for today is public schooling. Uh, Corey wrote uh, an article uh, asking the question, is public schooling a public good? An analysis of schooling externalities. So, um, Corey, how about uh, before before we talk about that and and some of your other work, uh, h- how did you get into uh, studying school and and working with the Cato Institute in particular? Yeah, so I did my bachelor's and my master's degrees in San Antonio, Texas, uh, and I did them in economics under Dr. John Merrifield. And I'm not sure if you've heard of his work, but he's been doing a lot of school choice work for a long time now. And I just, you know, I happened to get lucky to have him as my advisor since I was growing up in San Antonio, Texas. Um, And he, you know, I kind of, he kind of pushed me towards doing the uh, Department of Education Reform uh, program, which is a PhD program in education policy at the University of Arkansas, where there, you know, there's a researchers like Patrick Wolf, who's a big school choice researcher, and uh, Jay Green, who has done a lot of very good education work. So I've really had a lot of great advisors. But yeah, just having a background in economics really opened my mind to to seeing how the school system could work a little differently. Um, so, you know, it just really started to interest me a lot, especially when I started my PhD um, to be able to fix the school system, to be able to produce better outcomes for, for children and society, and to just have more freedom in general in, in the school system. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting topic and, and an important one because uh, we, we make people spend a big chunk of their lives in schools. So if we're administering them badly or if we're creating bad incentives... Uh, it has a potentially large in, impact on on society. What's especially interesting is we all kind of grow up in this, you know, the the world that we have, and, and you know, everybody's kind of had schooling, um, and grown up in this world where it's just kind of expected that everybody goes to school from you know at least K through twelve, um, and you know, we we even have society pushing us even further to go do our undergraduate degrees or even master's degrees or, or further. And, you know, our parents had it this way as well, and, and their parents had it this way. I think people just kind of get used to this society that we've lived in. And when you actually get out of the K-12 through system and start to look back, it's still, it kind of, for me at least, it, it was really kind of a mind, it kind of blew my mind that, you know, we sit in these classrooms for, for so long. And, um, you know, there's just huge opportunity costs, and um, it's just uh, really important to, to understand that things can be done differently. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it it's all justified on the basis of learning, but you know, having having graduated from K through 12 and, you know, gone out into the world and started uh learning independently, I sort of realized that man, sitting in that classroom is not the optimal way to learn. Uh listeners right now uh, are are learning uh listening to podcasts and learning in their free time. I'm assuming that nobody's been assigned this mm-hmm. podcast episode uh, yeah. as part of a homework assignment. Although, if they have, th- th- say thanks to their <laughs> say thanks to your prof or, or teacher for doing that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it it's just uh, such a well established status quo, and I think we're all sort of prone to assuming that the status quo is the the best possible way things can be, or mm-hmm. uh, or at least is or some sometimes the only way things can be if we haven't really thought about it a lot. And then there's the maybe lighter, more reasonable assumption that, well, if it's the status quo, it probably got that way for a reason. Mm-hmm. And so it probably serves a, a good purpose. Um, so let's get into your your paper, Is Public Schooling a Public Good? Yeah, and where you know you ask the the titular question: Is it a public good, and also is it maybe a merit good or a demerit good? Do you want to uh, define those three terms? I think people are yeah. probably familiar with public good, but merit and demerit, mm-hmm. I'm less familiar with. 
Yeah. So obviously most of the people that listen to your podcast and you, especially, I mean, you're an economics PhD student, you get this, you know, the, the title, that's the easy question, whether public schooling is a public good. And accord, according to economists, it's obviously not a public good because it doesn't uh, meet either condition required of a public good, which is non-rivalry and consumption and uh, non-excludability. You can easily exclude people from a classroom if they don't pay to enter your classroom. It's the same reason why uh, you know, private schools operate effectively today. They can, they can exclude non-payers. You don't have a free rider problem. So there's not a strong incentive for government to really fund or operate the schools. But then there's another economic argument. You know, whether whether public schooling or schooling in general is a merit good. And a merit good is uh, a good that has on net positive externalities. Um, so an externality, you know, it's, it's essentially just an effect on third parties um, from a transaction. Or uh, what I like to just for the lay person, just like to explain it as, you know, a positive effect on society, essentially. So if I go to your school, I pay you to go to your school you benefit from the transaction because you get my money, obviously. I would benefit because I I would learn a lot of stuff from you. um, So I would have a private benefit. But then everybody else in in society, the argument goes, would be better off because I'm more educated now. And now everybody else gets to interact with me. They get to read my blogs. They get to hear this fancy podcast. And everybody else gets to free ride (laughs) off of my benefits so uh, some, some economists would argue that there is an argument for government funding of education because of those positive externalities in theory. Um, but I also go further in the paper to ask, well, we can't just assume that all the externalities around schooling, especially government schooling, are going to be positive. We don't know if schooling leads to a more educated populace than than if there was some other system that we'd have, like a system of private school choice, or whether if people were just getting educated at home. We don't know what the direction is from government schooling. But then there's also other, other externalities that, that are around schooling, such as um, you know obedience. So the compulsory education system from Prussia was really about obedience, not so much about education. And you can make an argument that obedience is actually on net a positive thing. If, you know, people are less likely to break the law, they're less likely to steal things from you, that could be a positive externality. But obedience could be a negative thing as well if, you know, if, if more obedient citizens are just less likely to get new things or, or think outside of the box. Um, so in this paper, essentially, I tried to add up all the theoretical externalities around government schooling um, that I can think of and what the evidence, and I used the best evidence that we have on all these different subjects and I try to calculate a net externality to, to see if it's a truly a merit good or a demerit good. And just to define demerit good, it would be a good with net negative externalities or negative effects on society overall. Hmm. Right. So, and by, by society, you mean people not subject mm-hmm. to the transaction itself, right? So, so the benefits to you and me when we transact are generally going to be taken into account in the in the price we negotiate when we when we uh you know, you know when I sell you services or vice versa. Yeah, so it's third it's the third party of the transaction, right? It's not the producer of the schooling or the the consumer of the schooling, it's everybody else essentially. Yeah, so so and you're you're specifically looking at government schooling, so uh the implied alternative would be not not unschooling but uh but private schools or charter schools? Uh, what, what's, what's your counterfactual? So the counterfactual in this study is private schools of choice. So we have a lot of evidence on the effects of private school choice programs, which we could talk a little bit more about the design of those studies. But yes, the, the counterfactual is, you know, if you weren't forced to go to a government school and to pay for the government school out of your property taxes, you would be able to do something else with that money. And, you know, you might use that money to go to a private school of choice. And, you know, that's the, uh, the best evidence we have is for this type of education system, a, a private system of education is looking at the private school choice evaluations. Um, but it's true that, you know, if you weren't forced to go to government schooling, it could also be that you just don't go to school at all. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of evidence that before people 
before we even had public schools and before people were compelled to go to schools, they were, you know, a large chunk of the population of the school age population was already going to school anyway. So I think the best, you know, the best counterfactual to use is, is attending a private school of choice. And it's the best, um, you know, if we're going to use scientific evidence, it's the best uh, counterfactual to use. Right. So you're trying to, uh, there, there are a lot of studies that look at, you know, one specific element of, okay, we, we introduced some level of choice into this area and, and this thing changed. You're trying to bring all that evidence together and say, okay, on, on many different aspects, what is the preponderance of the evidence mm. say? Does it say that, uh, that this school choice is an alternative to, uh, uh, government schooling without choice uh, is positive, negative. Mm-hmm. Let, let's talk about uh, which externalities you looked at. Uh, so you, you have a, a set of uh, externalities that, uh, that are, are basically amount to how educated is the populace in terms of math, reading scores, graduation rates. Uh, t- tell me about those and, and the studies that uh, look at them. Yeah, so the bulk of the estimates that we have for educated populace, um, I get from a meta analytic uh, review of the evidence. So you know, we we I look at all the experimental evaluations of voucher programs in the United States. Uh, there there are about twenty one around the world that use random assignment, but in the United States, there's only about six uh, seventeen uh, random assignment evaluations, and I use the meta analytic average of these studies. Um, to find, you know, what the evidence says on what the effect of voucher programs is on math and reading test scores. Um, and, you know, if you're not familiar with the school choice evidence, the, the way that, you know, ran, that we get at random assignment here and experimental about, you know, results is the fact that, you know, when more kids want to use a voucher program than there are slots available, The government says that these programs must use random lottery to determine who gets access to the program. Um, So what we have in the school choice literature is a robust set of evidence um, using random assignment methodology. We don't have to use many assumptions. Um, We just have to assume that central limit theorem is working as, as theorized. And we can actually get the causal effects of these studies. So I do the analysis separately for math and reading test scores. The way I get at a, a monetary benefit is I use a study by Eric Hanishek pu- published in uh, 2011. And what he finds is that essentially a one standard deviation increase in test scores is associated with around a 13% increase in lifetime earnings. Um, so yes, the, the Hanishek study is correlational, but it's the best study I have to monetize um, these test score effects to try to find a net externality on on society as a whole. So I do it separately for math and reading, but then I also do effects on graduation rates too. So I look at those that evidence and um, look at what the evidence says on graduation rates, uh, monetize that, and I also find a uh, you know an externality uh, based on that evidence as well. Right. Yeah. So the the strange thing here is that the the students are a party to the transaction, and so we should we should kind of think of uh, of of them as choosing. In in one scenario, they choose uh, their school, and in another, they don't. But uh, I guess uh, you could think of choice of school as kind of uh, like a lottery, where there's some chance that you graduate and some chance that you don't. Although, of course, there's uh, mm-hmm. A big element of of your own choice there. If people were truly uh, Homo economicus, then it would be hard hard to mm-hmm. explain why anyone would uh, would not graduate high school unless they were it had an, a tremendous psychic cost to to just doing the bare minimum to pass. Yeah, I, I think the way to explain like the graduation rate studies. You know, you know, it's it's not a selection bias thing because everybody selected into the lottery and and losers, uh, you know, uh, losers of the lottery, not you know, losers in general, <laughs> but uh, the losers of the lottery, you know, they were all just less likely to to graduate from high school. I think part of that is that you know private schools have a competitive um, incentive 
to, you know, keep their students interested. You know, a lot of just dropping out is just you don't want to be there anymore and you're not interested in sitting in class every day. Um, so maybe that the culture at the school is better. Maybe that, you know, the students actually feel like they're learning more. Um, but I do think that based on these studies, we, we can say it's the effect of the private schools relative to the government schools. Mm, yeah. And uh, as your, your paper says, uh, that the meta-analysis of 16 U.S. experimental studies finds uh, no statistically significant effect on reading scores, but it does increase math scores by around 7% of a standard deviation. So, I mean, that, that kind of lines up with my my intuition around what a school can and can't do because, you know, thinking back to, to schooling, the, the kids who are good at reading were the ones who read in their spare time. So, you know, ha- we, having a better or worse English teacher, I don't think would have a big effect on that. Mm-hmm. But math is something that you definitely learn in a classroom for the most part. Uh, of course, I grew up before the age of Khan Academy, so I can't mm-hmm. speak f- to that. But it seems that most of the math you learn is directed by a teacher and that the quality of the school and uh, by extension, the teacher would affect your ability to to do math. Right. And that's correct. Your intuition is correct that uh, and, you know, the most of the evidence suggests that schools can have bigger effects on math scores than reading. And I think some of the intuition behind that is, you know, a lot of the reading scores come from, you know, the vocabulary that you got you know, uh, growing up in a household, you know, a lot of the the state standardized tests that I would take in Texas growing up, as far as the reading section, it, was, it didn't seem to be a lot about what the teachers were telling me. It was, it was just mostly, you know, this sentence doesn't sound like it makes sense. And, you know, if you grow up in a household where you can just have that second nature, I think you have a huge advantage. And that's probably why, you know, uh, the like we're seeing with the private school choice evaluations is that they're having more effects on, on math scores because, again, like you said, that's where schools can make a, a bigger difference. But even with that meta-analysis, the overall results were null for reading. Um, but if you looked at, over time, the programs that have been around longer and, and students that have been around, you know, in these programs for longer periods of times, the test score effects tend to trend upwards. Um, so I'll, by the fourth year, the math and reading scores were both statistically significant and positive. And I think the reason for that is is because when students switch a school for any reason, they lose ground on math and reading achievement just from switching schools. So a lot of research has been done that finds that, you know, just switching schools in that first year has around, you know, a tenth to a fifth of a standard deviation reduction in test scores. So after the students kind of adjust to their new environments, it seems like the test scores trend upwards after that initial dip in test scores. So that that sounds good. Uh, it's definitely a strong point in favor of school choice. L- let's talk about uh, some of the other things you look at. Um, so those those aspects, the the math scores, the reading scores, we're kind of kind of assuming that a population that has more people who have graduated high school with better ability to read and do math is going to be a better society. And it's a very plausible connection there, right? You know, you can do, if you can read better, Mm -hmm. if you can do math better, you know, there's a higher chance that you will be someone who innovates in a way that, that really helps uh, society in general. Um, And it, it's, it's plausible, right? It, uh, you know, I, I think, it would be pretty hard to study, uh, at least in a sort of rigorous way. You can't really, it's hard to randomly assign <laughs> uh, math scores <laughs> to someone. And it, it's hard to look at, you know, the good someone does in the world throughout their life. Uh, it's very, very hard to quantify that. Uh, but, but the, you know. There is, mm-hmm. The best way to, I think that, that you know, to, to look at this, to see if, you know, math and reading test scores correlate with long-term outcomes is to look at studies, you know, like of school choice programs to see how they affect math and reading test scores and then follow the same kids and see if their effects on math and reading test scores predict effects on, you know, other things like like tolerance or whether they commit crimes when they grow up. Um, there's actually a recent a, uh, American Enterprise Institute report out by Dr. Wolf and his colleagues that find that a lot of the school choice evidence the effects on math and reading test scores 
do not predict uh, effects on longer term outcomes. It actually seems that the longer term outcomes and these, you know, non-cognitive skills seem to be more positive for school choice. So, so yeah, they, they do increase math and reading test scores by some, but it seems like the effects on these other outcomes are actually much more positive. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, you could almost think of uh, the school choice element as an instrument for, uh, for the effect of, you know, math mm-hmm. and reading on later in life outcomes if if you were willing to accept the assumption that school cho- that your school affects your math and reading ability and not uh, and then your math and reading ability affects your likelihood of committing crime or or some other measure mm-hmm. of your uh, uh of your <laughs> outcomes in the long run your your life outcomes then then you could say that like uh, w- mm-hmm. th- this is an instrument uh, you know, th- this is a way to independently vary math and reading ability and then look at its effect right. on crime. But that depends on the assumption that there aren't some other mechanisms there that when you get into a uh, a different school, you, you might, for instance, have a different peer group, which would be a, a, um, mm-hmm. a pretty clear way to, uh, to affect uh, pe- people's outcomes. Although, of course, with the random lotteries, maybe the peer group would be the same in different schools. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me about uh, how your specifically about those measures of uh, mm-hmm, w- mm-hmm. social cohesion. They in your paper, you you look at crime and tolerance and political participation and even yeah. racial integration. Where where do those measures come from? Uh, so there's a bu- bunch of studies on these types of outcomes. For instance, I did a you know a systematic review of the evidence that's currently published in the Journal of School Choice. I'm um, looking at these types of social cohesion outcomes like tolerance of others, criminal activity, uh, political participation, and the the review of the evidence that I did was experimental and quasi experimental studies. Uh, so like the the evaluation of the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program, the DC Opportunity Scholarship Programs, all in there. So I limited it to U.S. studies that were quasi experimental and up. None of the eleven studies found negative effects on these types of things, um, and and the majority, six out of the eleven, found positive effects on these types of outcomes. Um, So, for example, for tolerance, um, the researchers, so this was the DC program, they used random assignment, and the researchers asked on a survey, you know, who, what what type of group do you disagree with the most? So they, they'd write, the students would write in an answer like communist or something else, whatever that is. And the (laughs) next question would ask, how likely, you know, would you allow this, this, a person from this group to run for office? Would you allow them to talk about their views in public um, and you know the the school choice students that won the lottery were about 50 percent more likely to say that they would allow people that they disagree with to to do these types of things so that you know that's not a perfect measure of tolerance but I think it's pretty good I'm not sure how you can get much closer than that criminal activity we actually followed the kids I, I did this study in with the Milwaukee uh, voucher program followed the kids using, you know, individual student level data from the state mandated evaluation and looked up their criminal records online. Surprisingly, in Wisconsin, if you have just first name, last name and date of birth, you can look up those three pieces of information online and find people's criminal activity. Um, So we looked up the criminal activity of kids when they, you know, by the time they were about 25 years old and they were the kids that got at least four years of the program uh, by the time they grew up were about half as likely to commit different types of crimes. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's it's weird for me because I don't like that invasion of privacy, but I like it as a as a social scientist because I was able to get my hands on on the data and produce a nice study. But yeah, th- so this is the type of, you know, in in the table one of my report, this is how I I use these types of studies to find that the government schools relative to the private schools on net had a negative effect on society. But in my final calculations where I tried to monetize it, I left all of these studies out of the, you know, of monetizing an effect. Um, so I argue that the monetized effect that I find of around a trillion in my conservative model is is extremely conservative because I 
assume that the benefits to social co- cohesion are just zero, which is not is probably not the case. Yeah, yeah. So um, that that's social cohesion, uh, excluding you do include crime, correct? Uh, in in your measure of the monetization of of the benefits, yeah. crime. Um, I, I was able to find a study to you know calculate the social cost of a felony. Um, so I only, but I only took mm. you know like this. That study also found that misdemeanors were reduced, um, but I couldn't find a, a strong measure for that and totally just assume that you know all those types of benefits were zero. But you know, for stuff like tolerance and political participation and racial integration, I couldn't find very strong evidence, you know, to to try to get a, a, a attach a number to those types of outcomes. So I, you know, I just left those as zero and said, you know, these these are conservative estimates because I don't want to, you know, overstate the case. Right. So we should think of your your estimates as a lower bound. Let Let's talk about that process of assigning a monetary value to school choice vis-a-vis the lack of st- school choice. Um, it's, it, it's, I mean, it's what we ultimately want to know is, uh, is, is the one system better than another. And so, you know, you could just have a list of, okay, there's this effect and that effect. Uh, and mm-hmm, since mm-hmm. they pretty much all go in the same direction, you could come to a pretty strong conclusion but in in cases where you have some positive and some negative effects you have to have some way of weighing them against each other and saying okay what should be our biggest concern and so that's why you know in policy analysis we yeah, often yeah. bring things all down to a dollar value um or dollar equivalence so t- tell me about that that process of uh of taking these various disparate effects and assigning them dollar values. How, how did you go about doing that? Yeah, so I tried to use the most conservative estimates possible. So like, for example, in, in one, you know, I I, I, I use two sets of assumptions, but I mostly cite my conservative, you know, one point something trillion effect. And the way I do that is I assume that the, you know, the reading test scores are the legitimate test score effects, which are zero. So I essentially just make that a, a zero. And then, you know, like taxpayer costs, obviously private schools, you know, cost a lot less than, than public schools. And I calculate that two different ways, for example. Um, one is that I just look at, you know, the voucher programs that are in place right now. And, and I see how much those, the value, the average value of the voucher is compared to the traditional public school funding amount. Um, so, you know, this website called EdChoice, which, you know, used to be called the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice, has a lot of information on, on private school choice around the United States. And, you know, they, they find that about the average voucher amount is about 59% of the per pupil funding amount in public schools. So if you spread that 59%, you know, uh, 55% lower cost a, a, across, you know, 50.477 million students in the United States that attend public schools, you get a pretty large cost savings. That's one way I, I, I calculated that. Um, but I even took another, a more conservative way to do it than that, which is to just compare using, you know, the federal government's data on how much private uh, tu- school tuition is compared to public school uh, expenditures. And, you know, I just uh, take the take the difference between those averages and then multiply them across, again, the, the the about 50 million uh, public school students in the United States. So I try to, you know, uh, report a lot of different types of, you know, I try to use different types of calculations and always go with the more more conservative one, you know, like with graduation rates also, the only experiment that exists found a 21 percentage point increase in graduation from, from using a voucher program. Instead of using that, I used the quasi experiment that, that found a three percentage point increase. Um, mm. Just because, again, I don't want to overstate the case. And again, yeah, I, I do think it's important to assign numbers to these things because otherwise you just see table one, you see negative, negative, negative. You have no idea how influential or how, you know, uh, what the magnitude of these effects are. Yeah, yeah, it, it's very interesting that you're, that you're using, you're trying to be as conservative as possible because I think Cato has a reputation as being you know, it's an 
you know, Cato has a position, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people want to dismiss mm -hmm. uh, any research coming out of Cato or or uh, any similar organization uh, as, oh, you know, well, mm -hmm. that's that's biased, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's pretty clear that um, you know, by by taking the the lowest estimates or the estimates that are most favorable to non school choice and least mm -hmm. favorable to school choice, and using those for your estimates in each case, that the number you come to, which by the way is uh, one point three three one mm -hmm. trillion twenty seventeen dollars uh, in, in savings from. That's from switching the entire United States to a school voucher system? Yes, yeah, so that would be a universal program, you know, not forcing anybody to go to government schools, letting all 50 million children go to a private school of their choice. Uh, and it, it's important to note that the $1.3 trillion would, is, is the net present value over the lifetime of one cohort of students in K-12. through so each cohort of students, it, it could be, you know, a, about at least 1.3 trillion over their lifetimes of an effect on the United States uh, overall. Okay. And so if you have, oh, let me think about this, that that's a discounted value, but roughly speaking, if you have many overlapping cohorts and they're all roughly the same mm -hmm. size and, and generate the same savings, then that would be a savings of 1.3 trillion per year. Yeah, but there, you know, there might be, uh, uh, there might be diminishing returns. Um, so you got to consider those things as well. I just, that's why I didn't try to, uh, in the report, I didn't try to, you know, multiply it out over cohorts or anything. Just say, look, you know, I'm just taking a snapshot of of the K through 12 system right now, and this is the negative effect it seems to have over the lifetime of this cohort of students. And so not sure how much we can say beyond that. Uh, just because of diminishing returns and, um, you know, the external validity of these studies and whether they can apply to, you know, future cohorts or, or different systems. Yeah. And in that conservative estimate, uh, I'll point out that uh, about 0.889 trillion of the effect come, uh, of the savings of uh, switching to school choice comes from the savings to taxpayers. And and I should should point out that even researchers who are very skeptical of school choice generally find that it lowers costs. Like that that particular point is uh, is not contested. Yeah, that's the easy one, and it's it's like the biggest savings is to the taxpayer because school private school choice bills are written in ways to force these kind of savings. It's it's written in the law, so there's no there's no real argument to be made about it. You know, a lot of the time, like when they're proposed, it's just a political feasibility thing that, you know, hey, this is going to be fiscally beneficial. So maybe we can get school choice to try to, you know, convince the, the legislators to, to vote on these things. But, yeah, it, it depends on the state. Sometimes it's 90 percent. Sometimes it's a lot less than 90 percent of the, the per pupil funding amount. Um, but then even then, like even if you have a voucher that's 90 percent of the funding amount, like let's say it's nine thousand if your tuition at the private school is five thousand, the, the private school only gets five thousand. They don't get nine thousand dollars. So there's there's room for even more savings than that than what the bill would suggest. Okay, so having established then that a conservative estimate taking the least favorable numbers in all cases gives a, a savings of one point three trillion per cohort uh, over the entire lifetime of that cohort. So. Mm -hmm. Saving money while they're in school, and then having uh, a little bit less crime, and and potentially some benefits from having more people graduate school, mm -hmm. you know, then those benefits being stretched out over you know their whole lives, you get one point three trillion yep. in savings. Uh, tell me about your um, less conservative estimates. Uh, when you what are you doing with those? Are you taking just sort of the median numbers, uh, median estimates of each thing? Well, the only difference here is for the alternative estimates, you know, which can be found in Table Three of the report, is for the educated populace piece. I instead of looking at reading scores, which had a zero effect, the biggest difference here is looking at math score, the math score effect of you know around seven percent of a standard deviation uh, positive effect, and you know the reason that sounds small. Is that's a seven percent standard deviation for one year of schooling? So you multiply that over thirteen years throughout your K through twelve experience, 
Um, and those are lifetime earnings using that, you know, 2011 um, Han- Eric Hanushek paper, uh, you know, that found a one standard deviation increase in test scores is associated with around a 13% increase in lifetime earnings. So that's the biggest difference in the two. Other than that, the taxpayer costs, I used actually the more realistic taxpayer benefit calculation by using the ed choice number saying that, you know, the vouchers are typically on average in the United States, uh, 59% of the, of the, the amount that's spent in traditional public schools. And, you know, just in case the listeners aren't familiar with how much is spent in the United States, it's about, uh, it's over 13,000 per year per student in traditional public schools. So, you know, 59% of that is around the average voucher amount. Um, you know, and it varies as well. So like in DC, for example, it's around $30,000 per kid per year in the United States. So we're spending a ton of money on the current system and not getting a lot of really great outcomes. But yeah, that those are the two big differences in the, you know, the conservative versus the alternative estimates. And, and you know, I, I do think that both are, are quite conservative estimates. Um, just again, because I don't want to overstate the, the case, but table two is really just, you know, really trying to, 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 to set a lower bound. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out that the 7% of a standard deviation is for one particular year because yeah, yeah as, as you say, over, over the entire course of your schooling, uh, that <laughs> being 7% of a standard deviation every year that adds up uh, or mm-hmm. does it add up or does it multiply up? But e- either way, it's going to come out to more than a, a whole standard deviation by the time you graduate. And that that also fits with uh, what, what I what I know about um, about people's math experiences, uh, having tutored people who had trouble with uh, university math. Often their story was they they were they were good at math they liked math until they got one really bad teacher <laughs> and then they fell behind and then they stayed behind and they you know they ever ever since say the tenth grade or something they they've just not understood any of the math because they they didn't have the next necessary background so uh-huh. that that intuition of a of a a building effect where you know you just you learn a little bit more one year and then you know more the next year and so you learn that you learn a little bit more again (laughs) and of course uh and then you hit calculus oh and well hey uh you know well i (laughs) not everyone not everyone can do calculus but uh uh economists certainly can so uh yeah that's uh (laughs) yeah if you if you're listening to this and you're in high school and you are good at calculus consider majoring in economics where those skills will pay off uh but so um yeah so so let's let's talk about uh the the policy implications of this i i think i think they're pretty clear but uh um just like the what's the general takeaway that uh, that policymakers should should have from from this evidence yeah i mean i would argue that uh, if we're going to fund schooling through the government, it should be in a system that works better uh, for the taxpayers and for the individuals that have to sit through the school system for around 13 years or more. So the, the program that I would argue for, although most of this uh, you know, evidence is based on voucher programs, there's a better program that's being suggested around the country, which is called an education savings account. Um, so it's like a voucher. And if you don't know what a voucher is, you know, you, Essentially, most people are residentially assigned to a, a government school, and they have public funding going towards the, those schools for to to fund their educations. If that school is not working for whatever reason, they can opt out, use a fraction of those funds to go to the private school of their choice. An ESA or education savings account works similarly, um, but that you you can opt out of your your residentially assigned school, get a fraction of those funds, take it to a private school of your choice, or you could. Uh, you know, use it on other types of educational services, such as uh, tutoring, textbooks, um, and you can roll over the funds from year to year, which is really important because uh, when you can roll over funds, you have the incentive to economize. Um, so with the ESA program, you don't get the price floor problem that you would get in a voucher. So like earlier I was talking about, you know, if you had a $9,000 voucher, 
and a private school tuition is 6000 they only get 6000 and as a consumer you don't have an incentive to 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 get a school that's 6000 you have an incentive to get a school that's 9000 so what happens if you have a universal voucher in theory is that there would be a price floor at that 9000 um, but with the ESA, you know, you spend the 6000 on the tuition and you can use the 3000 for other things and you can even roll it over for college if if you uh, want to do that as well. So you economists should love ESAs, um, you, especially if they really love, um, you know, voucher programs uh, just because of the price fixing problem. Right. Um, so I think that's the best path going forward. And, you know, based on the evidence here, you know, it, it, sh- it shows that private school choice works relative to government schools. And this, you know, this makes sense in theory as well, that if schools have a incentive to do a good job, um, you know, if they're, if consumers can pick the services that they get, the providers have to do a better job because of a, you know, decrease in monopoly power. Um, so yeah, that's the main takeaway here. And, you know, just going back to the title, there's not a strong argument Based, you know, there's not a strong economic argument for why government needs to operate schools, especially if there's, you know, no free rider problem, and you know, if, if schooling is not a public good, and you know, it, it, the, this study really looks into whether it's a merit good, and so one one can take away, you know, from this negative effect that that yeah, if if we're gonna spend money on schooling, it should be where people like to go to school. Yeah. So the issue here is between government provision of schooling so government running the schools you know hiring the administrators who then hire the teachers and having you know basically operating as the supplier of schooling versus mm-hmm. government paying for the schools in in various different ways either either with vouchers or with the ESAs that mm-hmm. you mentioned and so you know and and I mean that the, that that works basically like food stamps, right? So a private yeah. provider actually gives you, gets the food to you, you know, they coordinate the yeah. logistics and stock the shelves and do all those things. And then ultimately the government pays. And similarly with vouchers the, or with an ESA, the government is the one paying. Although depending on the type of voucher program, you can have systems where you are or aren't allowed to pay more out of pocket in addition to the voucher. Um, that's that's one of the the issues that uh, that comes up because people have fairness concerns about the the very wealthy buying mm-hmm. bu- buying their way into uh, you know super amazing uh, schools. Although I mean I have my doubts about mm-hmm. how which they already do. Yeah, yeah, they already <laughs> do. Yeah, one one thing that's not even in your study that I think would also bolster the uh, the case is the fact that um, property values reflect the quality of schools. So if you look at the dividing line between one school district and another, um, you know, the, ho- the home values in, in a good school district are going to be higher than you know, there, there's a discontinuity uh, <laughs> there uh, between good and bad school districts. And so, you know, people people pay lots more money when they they're buying their house yeah. to be to get their kids into a good public school. So I th- I think a lot of people's intuition about public schools is it's a level playing field where everyone gets the same uh, not at quality all. of service and everything. But no, no, if if uh, you, you're still paying, you're just paying uh, the uh, you know the mm-hmm. person who sells yeah, you, you your house. You buy your way in. Mm-hmm. You buy your way, your way in through your through your property value, and yeah, you know the the least advantaged are in the in the worst government schools today, and you know voucher programs are mostly currently targeted to the least advantaged. So, really, this should be a bipartisan type of policy. That if you're for equalizing society, you should be for vouchers. If you're for if you understand economics and you think that markets work, you should also be for uh, voucher programs. You you brought up uh, food stamps, which was really interesting, and that's that's true. Like like in the current system, it's almost as if the government is running the grocery stores, which is would would be a disaster in my opinion. But it's 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 even worse with education because we assen- like even if we had voucher a voucher program for all, which is what I typically argue for, that would be like having food stamps for everybody, and I don't think that 
that would be a good idea either. You know, like even if we found that, even if we knew that education, you know, in a school building had positive net externalities, I, you know, that, that still wouldn't be an argument that government needs to fund schooling, you know, vouchers or any, whatever it is for everybody. It would only be an argument that maybe, you know, uh, in order to get to that socially optimal level of consuming schooling or education or whatever you want to call it, there may be some incentive for the government to fund the least advantaged. But we don't have that in the current system. We have, you know, uh, the, the government funding mechanism for everybody. Yeah. And, and, and even if we have a universal voucher program, it's, it's simil- it would be similar to having food stamps for all. Yeah. Actually, when, I, when I think about it, um, that uh, ESA program you, you mentioned where it's a voucher, but you can roll it over. Um, if it's applied to everyone, it kind it's kind of like a basic income, but uh, you know, just for for young people, for people in the schooling phase of their life, one one could imagine uh, having having that program and then just you know having it switch over to being a, a basic income once someone's done school, and it it sort of has that structure of you know you give everyone a certain amount of money and it's fungible mm-hmm. it's it's like cash so people can spend it how they want and you know it's it's no coincidence that uh milton friedman who who's uh suggested the school vouchers i i think they were originally his suggestion uh yeah, to, yeah well, that's well cool. john stewart mill talked right. about it in on liberty oh, okay in chapter so, three so Fre- friedman uh popularized it in the 20th century in any case he did for sure and yep. and it's you know it's no no uh coincidence that uh Friedman and and uh, other other people who have supported school vouchers in the past have been positive towards different versions of a basic income for Friedman it was the negative income tax but uh that's close close to equivalent mm-hmm. uh, it's just a different mechanism for delivering it yeah and and Friedman also argued that you could have the voucher you know uh at higher amounts for lower income uh, individuals. So kind of like having less of a, uh, uh, food stamp for all. I'm not sure if he preferred that policy, but he did write about it and said, you know, if, if this is an option that you could, you know, if you care about, you know, equalizing society, or if that's your main goal that, that you could, you know, give it to everybody, but, but have a sliding scale based on your, your income levels. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you, if you were going to have any kind of phase out it would have to be gradual like that you would not want uh an abrupt mm-hmm. cut off mm-hmm. at the poverty line or something cuz then of course you create mm-hmm. a welfare yeah. cliff and yeah which is what we have with voucher which is what we have with a lot of voucher pro- pro- programs currently which is a problem you know it's they're they're yeah they're essentially tied to the uh the poverty level like uh, i think the Milwaukee programs like you know 300% of the poverty level or something and that that creates a bad cutoff, you know, people, people want to keep their, their K through 12 education funding and, you know, people want to be successful as well. But, you know, you set up a system like that with cutoffs, it, it makes it, um, you know, makes that marginal consumer uh, less willing to, to move up in the income brackets. Yeah. That's, that's a, a big worry if you're sitting at 299% of, uh, of the yeah, poverty line. Yeah. And, you know, your boss says, hey, uh, you know, you've been working hard. Uh, how about I give you a raise? All the time. You, you have to <laughs> you have to go. Ooh, ah, but if you give me a raise, I lose this yep. voucher, you know, and, and then I have to pay yep. this amount more. And it's it's uh, it's not a good incentive. So, I mean, hopefully to the extent that uh, voucher programs are implemented in the future, they're they're done without creating these uh, welfare cliffs mm-hmm. or or any kind of negative uh, incentive for the the parents, right? We want to create good incentives mm-hmm. for schools, but we don't want to create bad incentives for parents while we're doing mm-hmm. that. We we also don't want to overregulate these programs. That's that's been you know to be honest, that's been the biggest pain in the butt in the voucher debate currently. Is that you know there's 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 a lot of people that support private school choice, but then we've kind of divided into two separate groups and there's one of these you know one group which is which is me uh, the the group that I belong to which is you know let's just have let people pick the schools that work best for them whether it's you know if they raise test scores or not um, whether they pick them based on 
character education or academic achievement, let them pick. And then there's, you know, these other reformers that just want to regulate the crap out of school choice programs. Right. And, you know, essentially what, what you have over time is the schools, private schools that start accepting this government money with all the regulations start to look a lot like the government schools. And you, you pretty much have the same problem over and o- over and over again. Yeah. The, there's a, an appeal to, to half measures that, okay, let's try to make everyone happy. Even the people yeah. who really don't like this policy and will address all their concerns and will have regulations yeah. for this and this and this. And at a certain point, you know, have you have you even reformed the system or or have you just, uh, you know, changed it in, in superficial mm-hmm. ways? Let, let's talk a little bit in the last few minutes uh, we have about another s- short piece you wrote. Uh, it's titled, We Shouldn't Need to Use Science to Grant Educational Freedom. Yeah. So we've just talked through uh, your review of the, the science on, on school choice. Tell me about why the science is maybe uh, not, maybe not uh, super consequential in terms of uh, the the choice of policy. Yeah, so I'm glad you got to take a look at that recent piece. Um, I've been grappling it for, with it for a while because you know it it can almost look bad to an academic trying to publish things to try to be a scientist to say, oh, we shouldn't make policy based on the science. You know, it kind of it can sound bad at first, but I really believe that we shouldn't use you know the scientific evidence to force people to do certain things. Um, and, you know, the example I use in that blog is, you know, just imagine we randomly assigned thousands of families to government grocery stores, you know, where the government decided what the optimal, you know, grocery list was. And they produce all the food and stuff like that. And we found that, you know, on average, the people that were randomly assigned to the government grocery stores got, you know, they consumed fewer calories or whatever metric when you use, they have to slightly lower BMI. I think a lot of people would say that it would be ridiculous to use that evidence to say, okay, now, we, you know, look, you, you consume too many calories and, you know, we found this average effect. So everybody must now be assigned to a government grocery store where we pick the food that's best for everyone, for the, the good of the public, you know, for the social good. I think a lot of people would, would find that crazy. Um, What's concerning is a lot of people probably would like a society like that, that that would actually like the government to do all these things, which is kind of crazy to me. But hopefully there's some of us left that would that would think that that's a little nuts. But even then, there's just a lot of limitations to what scientists can do with the information that that they find, even with random assignment experiments. You know, uh, you know, everybody on this podcast should know that, it, you know, the uh the way that random assignment works is is partially because of the law of large numbers that we know that on average the treatment group and the control group are the same on observable and unobservable characteristics and we can tell that the effect on average that we find is the effect of the treatment that we're randomly assigning people to but that's just an average effect right we don't know that everybody that was randomly assigned to the government grocery store um, did better or worse with calories and health later on. We just know the average effect. So we shouldn't use policies about average groups to tell individual people what they can or can't do. Um, so I think that's one of the problems. And, and other problems are that, you know, central planners often use, you know, uh, experiments from a couple of years ago. And it could be that the government grocery stores got worse over time or that the the private grocery stores got better. Um, so you could be limiting people's freedom based on irrelevant information. So this is the external validity problem. I'm sure everybody's heard this one before. And, and, and then also, you know, um, experimental effects only apply to the group that you're looking at. So cohorts of students or you know people change over time. People learn from their mistakes about choosing bad things. Um, so it could be that the effects are no longer valid when when the new policy is being put into place. So there's so many problems, even if we're basing the policy based on experimental studies, which is the best thing that we have, there are still tons of problems when you try to get, uh, try to make the best decisions for individuals. And, you know, this is the basic knowledge problem that Hayek and others have, have brought up, that central planners just don't have the the ability, even using the best scientific tools we have to make uh, decisions for individuals that are diverse that change over time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I think you're uh, touching on is just the the presumption of liberty, right? Or the you know the the idea that unless there's a mm-hmm. strong body of evidence showing that intervention is necessary, we probably should just leave people to their own devices and count on them to solve their own problems, manage their own lives, etc. Yeah, I definitely agree with that point. Yeah, uh, so we're running low on time, so uh, do, do you want to uh, give your concluding thoughts on, on this issue? What should uh, a listener who's listened to this whole conversation take away as sort of the, the central message? I really don't take for granted, you know, what people will say about the public education system. Look at the actual studies. Um, look at the best studies out there, the random assignment evaluations. And, you know, uh, correct people when they say that public schooling is a public good, because, you know, if you talk to any economist, they'll tell you right away that it's not, it's just not, it's not true. Um, and there are a lot of important policy implications from that. Uh, and yeah, it, it might, you shouldn't also, you should also not take for granted that all theoretical externalities around schooling, especially when the government's operating the schools are going to be positive. They may actually have negative effects. And it's important to think about, um, you know, the policy implications that stem from that and how we should structure our education system. All right. And on that note, my guest today has been Corey DeAngelis. Corey, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. All right. Thanks for having me. That concludes today's episode of Economics Detective Radio. If you want to discuss school choice or any of the research that Corey uh, mentioned, you can go to Economics Detective on Facebook. That's a group. There's also an Economics Detective page. Feel free to like that. But because of the way Facebook's algorithm works, you know, you like a page, you follow a page, and Facebook doesn't necessarily show you the posts. Whereas in a group, you're, you're likely to get notifications and you be uh, included in, in discussion, shown things that you've asked Facebook to show you. Um, Facebook does this so that uh, brands will pay for advertising because, of course, if they just showed everyone who follows you your, your content, then why would you pay to show them <laughs> sort of holding your audience hostage? Anyways, join the group answer the questions. It's a closed group, so you just need to request access, but I'm not saying no to anyone, so don't worry about that. And the discussion question we'll be discussing today is, how convinced are you by the research showing that school choice is a superior alternative to the status quo? A follow-up question to that is, What do you think of this in light of Brian Kaplan's argument that school maybe is mostly signaling and perhaps we should have less of it overall, not just uh, funded in a different way or create different incentives, but actually have less education, have people spend fewer years in school? Uh, Which argument do you find more convincing? Would you prefer a world of less school or a world of the same amount of school but funded through vouchers or the status quo or some different alternative? Uh, Let me know in the Facebook group. Thanks, and I'll be back soon.